So how did we get from this to this? And how did we get from here to there? And maybe most importantly, how did we get from this place where people seem to love Jesus but can't stand his followers? Where people seem to be really fascinated by Jesus' personality, by what he did, by the way he cared for people, and primarily see the church as hypocrites and as bigots? Man, I think the answers to these questions are really important for us. They're really important for us to understand that somewhere along the line, we've lost the plot. We're gonna jump into the answers to these questions in just a minute, but first, I have a little thought experiment for you. Imagine you live in a world that's really confused, that's really stressful, that's really strained, where no one can agree on what's the right way forward, where no one can agree on what's the right way to live. Is any of this sounding familiar? Yeah, that's the world that you and I live in every day. We're not alone in this. This is also the world that the church in Rome lived in. The church in Rome was in living in an incredibly divisive time, an incredibly dangerous time. Rome was the capital of an empire. It was the cultural, political, and geographical center of kind of the known universe at that point. And within that capital city, there was a small group of believers that were really conflicted conflicted on what the right way to follow Jesus was. This banner that says, fight the good fight. Well, there's been lots of disagreements over time about how we as followers of Jesus fight the good fight. That line's actually pulled straight from a book of the Bible, again, written by a guy named Paul, where it encouraged us to stay strong, to stay faithful, to continue to fight the good fight, continue to race the good race. Like that's what we're called to be and we really struggle to know what that looks like. If you've ever wondered how you should live, if you've ever wondered what the right way forward is, hey, you are in good company, because that's where we all are at in one way or another, and where the church in Rome was at. Now, the church in Rome, a group of, let's say, 125 people, small community, trying to figure out what it meant to follow Jesus in their context, in their place in history, and in space. And in that moment, they began to fight. They began to have a lot of conflict between the different groups. And in that moment, they received a letter that was encouraging to them, that was clarifying for them, that showed them how the different pieces of their life fit together and how they were united in the person of Jesus. So let's go back and imagine in your chaos, in your confusion, in your uncertainty about, man, what you were put on this earth for and your uncertainty about the future. Imagine in the midst of that moment, you received a letter, a letter from a friend or a mentor that wasn't generic, it wasn't, hey, how are you doing? It was custom advice for you. It was guidance on how to move forward as a community and in your own life. That's exactly what the church in Rome received in the book of the Bible. We call it the book of Romans, but it wasn't a book just meant to be read top to bottom or a chapter. The book of Romans was actually a letter written to a community to help them understand how to live. And that's how I want you and I to receive, well, the book of Romans today, that it was written for us right where we're at, not just a generic thing in an ancient book, not just generic words for somebody else, but a letter written with great love, great care, and great intentionality for you. So today, I hope that we receive Paul's letters like they were intended, like they were a letter written to you and me to help us understand how we can navigate chaos, confusion, uncertainty about the future, and how we can understand how Christians have sort of lost the plot, why we don't look as much like Jesus as we're supposed to. And I think the answer to that question and more is, well, that Christians have forgotten one word. That word is used 179 times in the Bible, so we don't really have an excuse. It's not like it doesn't come up much, but the word that we've forgotten is grace. God's grace. God then gave me more than I asked for, because he got this thing he has called grace. And show him grace that he doesn't deserve. Of the story of the gospel of God's grace in all of scripture. 
Grace is this amazing word that shows up a lot and it embodies the fact and the reality that we have a before and after, that God has moved in our lives and changed us and made us different, right? Unfortunately, Christians aren't immediately recognizable for this in the ways that they initially were. Christians have brought many, many amazing things to the world like public education, like uh, the first sort of modern expression of hospitals and social care and many things that we sort of take for granted. But unfortunately, that type of innovation around change in the world isn't seen as readily as it once was. And Christians are known more for being insular or being hypocritical or being judgmental than they are changing the world. Crossroads started doing a thing where every day in the Crossroads Anywhere app, we as a community are reading through the Bible together, just a chapter or so. And then we have a chance to respond to that and sort of post a public journal entry about what we get out of that passage or what that makes us think about or do. We're doing that in line with Romans. Romans 1 sort of starts off like right out of the gate, coming in hot with a list of a bunch of things that we probably don't want to do. It's a bunch of like negative behaviors. The very first comment wasn't anything personal. It was just a person putting an entire group of people on blast for not living up to the standards of Romans 1. People who don't believe the same things that we believe, people don't think the same things that we do, just getting lit up. The Bible, Romans 1, not being used as a letter of encouragement or direction or guidance, but instead just as ammunition. But it just made me really sad about what have we missed? How have we lost the plot that this is more about how we can judge other people than it is for how we can live better ourselves. And it's in that moment that I was initially sad and frustrated, and then I just got a fire like in my gut of like, man, this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not how we're supposed to be. No, I've been judgmental plenty of times, so there is zero, zero angst in me about this. It's just, man, we have a ways to go to lean into what Jesus would have for us and how he would have us respond to the world around us. So Romans 1 has this list of, well, behaviors that we probably want to avoid aren't great for us. Romans 2 follows it up with this great line that just says, you therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment to do those same things. That's that hypocritical thing that I think the church is unfortunately known for. One of the best examples actually that I've heard recently about this deep understanding of grace and how our own before and after sort of help and inform that and enforce that, encourage us to extend grace to others, was actually from Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a writer, author, professor, theologian named Stephen Raines, who literally wrote a book that asks a really good question. He says, why can't church be more like AA? He asked this question because he describes his experience of his life being absolutely ravaged by addiction and the power that he experienced by being a part of a community that openly and actively shared their brokenness, shared their stories of hurt, and shared hope for one another for a different path forward and how it just changed everything for him. He says it this way, that AA members would become accustomed to receiving things like hope and healing and authenticity and vulnerability in the church basement on Saturday and then come up on Sunday morning into the church pew and wonder where all of those same things went? It's a really good question. We are meant to identify with our brokenness, to remember our before, and that it's God's grace that gave us a different after than we ever could have provided for ourselves. And when we remember our before, our grace that God offered us and our after, we can extend that same grace to others. And I would say we can't help but extend that grace to others. So the whole picture of Christians as uptight, as religious, as hypocritical, as angry, mean, joyless, I mean, all those things show just how much we've missed the mark. That's not who Jesus was. That's not who his followers are supposed to be. We should be the most hope-filled people on the planet. We should be the most joy-filled people on earth. And we should absolutely be the most quick to extend grace to everyone around us when they fail, when they fall, when they don't measure up to whatever. We have a chance to offer something that the world 
is not offering, and that is grace. It's one of those things that just makes me sad about cancel culture, right? Cancel culture, a lot of Christians get really bummed out about it. The reality is Christians invented cancel culture. Like it was kind of our sweet spot for like hundreds of years where if anybody didn't do all the things that we required of them, well, then we would write them off, then we would cancel them, then we would put them on the outs, literally sometimes. That's not who we're called to be. We are called to be the most gracious people on the planet because we need to remember how much grace, how much forgiveness, how much love has been shared with us. The important reality here is that grace makes us new. It doesn't just like patch us up. It doesn't just sort of put a fresh coat of paint on. It doesn't just help us be better versions of ourselves. Scripture's really clear that grace makes us new. Second Corinthians puts it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. That's who we are. We are new creations and we get to offer tons of grace to other people as they become new themselves. There's a quote that I love and it says, Grace isn't just about pardoning sinful behavior. It's about rewiring the sinner themselves. It's not just about getting on our best behavior. It's about experiencing something that changes us from the inside out, that makes us a new creation. And man, we as followers of Jesus should just acknowledge that not everybody is in the same place. We shouldn't expect people who don't believe all the same things that we believe to act all of the ways that we would act, right? Let's be quick to extend grace. You and I are the recipients of so much grace, and that should make us really, really amazing at extending grace to one another. And it's when we forget grace, it's when we forget how much we've been changed, how much grace we've been afforded, it actually keeps us from connecting with one another. And we forget that grace connects us. Grace can show up in your life in moments of chaos, in moments of confusion, in moments of need. Whether that need is physical, whether that need is emotional, spiritual, or whether that need is just practical. I've experienced so much grace in the context of connection and community as my family and I have been between houses now. It's supposed to be a week and we're going on two months living out of suitcases. We've experienced so much grace with friends letting us stay with them, with people helping us out, watching our kids. It's been wonderful. And we're only experiencing that kind of grace, that kind of grace that supports, that kind of grace that encourages because we're attached to a community. Now, Romans 12 puts it this way. For as in one body, we have many members and the members don't have all the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who acts with mercy, with cheerfulness. When we bring our different personalities, our different wiring, our different resources, our different gifting, together in the context of community. And we share so much grace with one another and the body, the church functions as it was intended. People are our DNA around here and how we treat them has always been a key part of who we are as Crossroads and as the overall capital C church across the world. This is from the seven hills that we die on. We want to grow by really doing life together. People who grow in their relationship with God also grow in their friendships with each other, moving beyond the auditorium and groups, both in person and virtually, and through serving. Real community is knowing and being known, loving and being loved, celebrating and being celebrated, serving and being served. The reality is that you and I are surrounded by amazing people, amazing people that we were made to need. And that goes for everyone. Everyone is made in the image of God, even the ones you and I might find annoying, or it's true even for you and me, when other people might find us annoying. Grace enables us to connect. Grace enables us to experience the full value that everyone around us has being made in the image of Jesus. And when we just understand that we all were made with this deep, innate sense of uh, purpose and deep, innate value. We can extend grace to one another. We can connect in meaningful ways that grow our ability to serve one another, to help share each other's burdens and care for one another. And grace doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with just changing us. It doesn't just stop with 
uh, connecting us. It actually compels us to move forward. And whether we choose to acknowledge it or not, we need each other in all kinds of ways. But that's only possible if we extend each other enough grace to actually connect. And I actually have a way that you can connect with real community that I want to talk to you about right over here. Okay, it's a fascinating book that was released a while back called Bowling Alone that talks about the decline in community in the United States and really around the world as a result or in coordination with kind of the technology age. Technology was supposed to help us connect better, but in some ways it's just made our connections shallower. Now, I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, but as a pastor, I talk with lots of people and the vast majority of people that I talk to are looking for better or deeper friendships. They want better connections. They want deeper connections in their life. And man, I relate to that as a guy who's moving to a new city. I feel like I'm starting over in many ways relationally. And it's why I'm doing what I'm doing, which is using groups at Crossroads to help myself connect with people. Now, we are kicking off a group season. We have tons of groups all over the place launching in person, online. You can connect with lots of people and I think find or create your community. But you're gonna have to take a step forward. You're gonna have to lean in to make it happen. Now, I don't know of really any tools out there to help people connect other than dating apps I hear, but this is a tool that can actually help you make friends and connect with people. Just go to crossroads.net slash groups. Look around and find your people. So there are tons of things going on around Crossroads online and in person all over the world. And if you wanna check them out, you can do so at crossroads.net. But all of that stuff only happens because we have faithful, generous people who give their time and their money to help fund the life change that's happening around Crossroads. So if you have questions about what we spend our money on or the decisions we make with our finances, or you wanna join the team of faithful people who makes this stuff possible, you can do all those things at crossroads.net slash give. Now, back to grace. Grace compels us. It's meant to push us, to move us forward. Now, if you've ever met a Christian that seemed like they had something stuck up their butt, well, they might have. That might have actually been the case. I think there is a dynamic that is all too common in sort of church today that I just call Christian constipation. It's this obsession with getting more information, with more facts, even with more like good Bible knowledge but without ever doing anything with it. It's about taking in more stuff, more facts, more knowledge, but it just stays like in us and gets stuck there. It never gets applied. It never gets used to change the world. We need grace that moves in us and moves through us to change and, well, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That is what scripture describes. So in the same way, it's not good to just eat and eat and eat, but never well do anything with that. It's not good to just go to church and learn and research and gain more information without ever figuring out what it looks like for you to apply that in your own life. There's a really, really old question that, you know, when I was a kid, it was, what would Jesus do? And there were even these super cool little rubber bracelets. But the question really is, what would Jesus do if he were you? What would Jesus do if he was a single mom? What would Jesus do if he was a stay-at-home dad? What would Jesus do if he worked in finance or in the trades or was a high school student or was a professor? What, what would Jesus do if he were you? That's the question we need to answer if we want to avoid spiritual constipation. We've got to figure out what it looks like for us to apply the things that we've learned and to move, to be compelled by grace, to find a problem and to solve it. There's a passage from Romans 12 that puts it this way. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then it goes on to say, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. We have a chance to change the world. We have a chance to leverage our unique gifts, skills, abilities, talents, context, history to make an impact. And we get to be creative. We get to start on a process with God to figure out what it looks like 
for us to take the grace that's been given to us and to extend it uniquely in our own voice and our own style to a world that desperately needs it. There's a really smart guy named Charles Spurgeon who put it this way. If we give God service, it must be because he gives us grace. If we give God service, it must be because he gives us grace. We're not doing this just out of our own goodness. We're doing it because we've been changed, because we've been united and connected, and because we've been compelled forward to change the world. For all the negative pictures that there are, rightly so, of people who say they would follow Jesus but don't seem doing a very good job of it, there are so many pictures of people who have man, been transformed by this grace, that it made them different people, not just better people, but different people, that it rooted them in the context of community and deep connection, and that it compelled them forward in powerful, powerful ways. That's the story of Romans, that you and I can receive that kind of grace, that it can take us to a new place, that it can make us new people, that it can see us grafted and adopted into family. Man, don't those things sound amazing? And aren't those things that we need? And aren't those things that our world needs? The kind of grace that Jesus offers never leaves us static. It never leaves us the same. It is not interested in the status quo. It leaves us changed and it sends us to new places. You and I get to be a part of not just receiving that grace, but extending that grace to others. Now, maybe where we started this whole thing has been your reason for not wanting to receive grace. Maybe the depictions of Christians that you've experienced in your life just sort of have you doing this and keeping things at arm's length. I get it. I really, really do. And you need to know that wasn't God's grace for you. God's grace for you is that even with all of your flaws, even with all of your brokenness, even with all of your imperfections, you are perfectly loved. That God wants to save you, that He wants to bring you to a new place, not just in understanding or in your head knowledge, not just in your heart, but to bring your life to a new place modeled after how He designed you. That's the story of grace for you. Tim Keller puts it this way, the truth of the gospel is that we are more broken than we ever could have understood and that we are more loved than we ever could have imagined. Man, that's God's grace for you, that you are deeply loved and He has great things in store for you. And if you want to receive God's grace for you, hey, I'd love to talk to you about that. I'd love to process that with you, help you understand what that means. You can just email me, andy.writer at crossroads.net. I'd love to talk to you about that and help you experience and understand what God's grace for you looks like. And there's an opportunity that we have here. So in the same way that the book of Romans was really a letter written to encourage and extend grace to a community, you and I have the chance to do that every day in, in certain ways, but actually to do that right now, to extend grace and encouragement to someone who needs it. If you click the link below, it'll take you to a form where you can write a note to a person that you care about and that you want to see encouraged. We'll do the work of getting that sent to them, printed, addressed, mailed, and in their hands so that they can experience more of the grace that you have for them and more of the grace that the Lord has for them. So if you would, I'd just love for you to pray with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you for each person that is a part of this community and each person that is getting to watch this right now. God, I may not know them personally, but I know that you love them deeply and that you have so much grace on hand to offer them. You have grace for the things that they've done wrong. You've got grace for the ways that we have failed and you have grace for just the chaos of our life and the strain and stress of just everyday living. Father, would you be with us would you just uh, be extra near to us, offer your comfort, offer your encouragement, offer your grace to us right where we're at in the ways that we need most. Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us. As always, we'd love for you to come back next week. It's actually gonna be a really special start of a series, something we haven't done in a long time. We're diving into who we are as a community. This is one of the strangest churches I've ever experienced in really, really wonderful ways. If you've ever wondered why we are the way that we are or why we do the things that we do, this is gonna be the perfect time for you to understand the vision and the culture and the DNA of this place and why 
we run. Thanks for watching.